Thank you Chapter very much. Seven. Mm -hmm. The Good Book and the Changing Moral Zeitgeist. I shall read a little bit from that. I'm keeping a tally of the people walking out. I think it's about three or four so far. <laughs> There are two ways in which scripture might be a source of morals or rules for living. One is by direct instruction, for example, through the Ten Commandments, which are the subject of such bitter contention in the culture wars of America's boondocks. The other is by example. God, or some other biblical character, might serve as, to use the contemporary jargon, a role model. Both scriptural roots, if followed through religiously, encourage a system of morals which any civilized modern person whether religious or not, would find, I can put it no more gently, obnoxious. <laughs> Abraham was the founding father of all three great monotheistic religions. His patriarchal status renders him only somewhat less likely than God to be taken as a role model. But what modern moralist would wish to follow him? God ordered Abraham to make a burnt offering of his longed-for son. Abraham built an altar, put firewood upon it, and trussed Isaac up on top of the wood. His murdering knife was already in his hand when an angel dramatically intervened with the news of a last-minute change of plan. God was only joking after all. <laughs> Tempting Abraham and testing his faith. A modern moralist cannot help but wonder how a child could ever recover from such psychological trauma. <laughs> By the standards of modern morality, this disgraceful story is an example simultaneously of child abuse, bullying in two asymmetrical power relationships, and the first recorded use of the Nuremberg defense, I was only obeying orders. <laughs> yeah. Yet the legend is one of the great foundational myths of all three monotheistic religions. Modern theologians will protest that the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac should not be taken as literal fact. And the appropriate response is twofold. First, many, many people, even to this day, do take the whole of their scripture to be literal fact. And they have a great deal of political power over the rest of us, especially in the United States and in the Islamic world. Second, if not as literal fact, how should we take the story? As an allegory? Then an allegory for what? Surely nothing praiseworthy. As a moral lesson? But what kind of morals could one derive from this appalling story? Remember, all I'm trying to establish for the moment is that we do not, as a matter of fact, derive our morals from scripture. Or if we do, we pick and choose among the scriptures for the nice bits and reject the nasty. But then we must have some independent criterion for deciding which are the moral bits, a criterion which, wherever it comes from, cannot come from scripture itself, and is presumably available to all of us, whether we are religious or not. Apologists even seek to salvage some decency for the God character in this deplorable tale. Wasn't it good of God to spare Isaac's life at the last minute? In the unlikely event that any of my readers are persuaded by this obscene piece of special pleading, I refer them to another story of human sacrifice which ended more unhappily. In Judges chapter 11, the military leader Jephthah made a bargain with God that if God would guarantee Jephthah's victory over the Ammonites, Jephthah would, without fail, sacrifice as a burnt offering whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return. Jephthah did indeed defeat the Ammonites, with a very great slaughter, as is par for the course in the book of Judges, and he returned home victorious. Not surprisingly, his daughter, his only child, came out of the house to greet him with timbrels and dances. And alas, she was the first living thing to do so. Understandably, Jephthah rent his clothes, but there was nothing he could do about it. God was obviously looking forward to the promised burnt offering, and in the circumstances, the daughter very decently agreed to be sacrificed. She asked only that she should be allowed to go into the mountains for two months to bewail her virginity. At the end of this time, she meekly returned and Jephthah cooked her. God did not see fit to intervene on this occasion. 
God's monumental rage whenever his chosen people flirted with a rival god resembles nothing so much as sexual jealousy of the worst kind. And again, it should strike a modern moralist as far from good role model material. The temptation to sexual infidelity is readily understandable, even to those who do not succumb, and it's a staple of fiction and drama from Shakespeare to bedroom farce. But the apparently irresistible temptation to whore with foreign gods is something we moderns find harder to empathize with. To my naive eyes, thou shalt have no other gods but me would seem an easy enough commandment to keep. A doddle, one might think, compared with thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or her ass <laughs> or her ox. Yet, throughout the Old Testament, with the same predictable regularity as in bedroom farce, God had only to turn his back for a moment, and the children of Israel would be off and at it with Baal or some trollop of a graven image. <laughs> or, on, some, on one calamitous occasion, a golden calf. There then follows a section on Moses, which I'm going to cut. Go on to the end of the Moses section. The ethnic cleansing begun in the time of Moses is brought to bloody fruition in the book of Joshua, a text remarkable for the bloodthirsty massacres it records and the xenophobic relish with which it does so. As the charming old song exultantly has it, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came a-tumbling down. There's none like good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho. Good old Joshua didn't rest until they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. Joshua 6, 21. Yet again, theologians will protest it didn't happen. Well, no. The story has it that the walls came tumbling down at the mere sound of men shouting and blowing horns. So indeed, it didn't happen. But that is not the point. The point is that whether true or not, the Bible is held up to us as the source of our morality. And the Bible story of Joshua's destruction of the Lebensraum of Jericho and the invasion of the Promised Land in general is morally indistinguishable from Hitler's invasion of Poland or Saddam Hussein's massacres of the Kurds and the Marsh Arabs. The Bible may be an arresting and poetic work of fiction, but it is not the sort of book you should give your children to form their morals.